Wikipedia continues to evolve as information changes, which helps it prevent becoming static or out of date. You know, as we learn more about the world, as our understandings of what constitutes really kind of anything um, evolves, we edit Wikipedia and our knowledge evolves along with it. So there's that component piece and these sort of different approaches, which are codified in Wikipedia's policies from these sort of different sectors, has proven to be really resilient for the production of high quality information. Hello and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. I spent a lot of time on the internet. You probably know that if you listen to the podcast, you probably spent a lot of time on the internet. In fact, I think during the pandemic, we all basically plugged our brains in the internet nonstop and it drove us all collectively mad. And, uh, you know, well, this is a sort of recurring theme on this program about why does the internet suck? Which is overstating the case because there's lots of great things on the internet. Some, you know, there, you, there's, there's pictures of a ship stuck in the Suez Canal and then funny memes about it, which we all share and love and, and, and make us laugh. And I can watch, you know, I can uh, follow the NBA trade deadline news, you know, in, in real time in a way that I would have to wait until the next day's newspaper. But there's also a lot of things about the current internet that are, that are a bummer. And I am old enough at the age of 42 to have sort of gone through a number of different waves of the internet. And, and one way to think about them, I think, are sort of open internet versus commodified internet. So when I first started getting on the internet in, say, 1992 or 93, um, my big thing was, because I was a real computer nerd, I like got my own ISP access and I sidestepped AOL and Prodigy and CompuServe and I was directly internet. And, and I was on the part of the internet that was very decommodified. So we had Usenet news groups, which were kind of like subreddits. Um, there was, and then the World Wide Web emerged with graphical user interface where you could browse around and, and go to web pages. And then over time, what's happened is that uh, the internet got re-commodified, right? So there used to be this commodified version of it through these online services, then it got decommodified, and now it got recommodified through a lot of the big social media platforms, which increasingly, you know, our interactions on the internet are mediated through massive multi-billion dollar corporations with huge amounts of resources that are basically there to try to hack our attentional circuits, right? So their job is to figure out ways to get as much of our attention and engagement as possible so that they can monetize our attention through advertising revenue. And that leads to a lot of toxic stuff, I think. One big exception to this is an internet institution that kind of arose during a decommodified period in the internet. It, it, it sort of was like an example of a very crowdsourced, here comes everybody, non-market mode of collaboration that was extremely uh, in vogue <laughs> about 20 years ago, where the internet was going to change everything and everyone was going to work with each other in these sort of non-market collaborative ways, and no one was going to own anyone else. And that one institution has managed to persist through the commodification of huge other parts of the internet. And I'm speaking, of course, of Wikipedia, which I'm sure that you use. I, today, when I was doing a little background reading on today's guest, I looked her up on Wikipedia, uh, which is something I do a lot. Um, and Wikipedia is an incredible thing. It's amazing that it exists. It's amazing that it hasn't succumbed to all of the pressures that have overwhelmed so many parts of the internet. It's amazing that it's not, you know, full of spammy ads. It's amazing that it doesn't algorithms that try to like hack your brain and push you towards increasingly insane conspiracy theories like, like some of the other platforms. Um, it's amazing that they raise money every year. It's amazing that it's done through this sort of this complicated collaborative process with its own kind of internal rules and dynamics and norms. It's amazing that it functions at all. And it's also a kind of like, to me, a little bit of a lost city of Atlantis of how once upon a time we imagined the internet of the future would be. And so I thought it would be awesome to have a conversation with the uh, individual who is the CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation. That's the nonprofit organization that operates Wikipedia and the Wikimedia projects. Her name is Catherine Marr. She's been in this position for a while, just announced that she'll be stepping down. She's got a fascinating history uh, in, in tech more broadly. She is one of the few women at the top of a large tech enterprise. And on a day when there's a big disinformation hearing in Washington and lots of real hard policy questions about what exactly these multi-billion dollar enterprises are doing to American discourse, 
I thought it would be great to talk to someone who is outside of that. Um, so Catherine, welcome to the program. Hey, Chris, thanks for having me. Can you just tell me a little bit about your background, how you how you ended up uh, being the CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation? Oh, uh, <laughs> sure. I think much like Wikipedia is, is so unique, uh, there's no real sort of thing you can do to prepare for being in this role. It, it's a tech organization. It's a nonprofit, as you said. It's a um, community of passionate global volunteers. I studied the Middle East when I was a student. I lived in mm -hmm. overseas for a while. I worked for UNICEF, um, the development organization, uh, looking at the way technology was changing services and aid. I moved to DC to work on human rights, democracy and governance support around the globe. Also looking at the way technology could both support folks who were uh, working to enshrine and 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 deepen their rights and the ways in which technology is deeply harmful uh, to sort of individual participation um, in free societies. And at some point, Wikipedia reached out. I, I you know, went through a process and joined them at first as their chief communications officer and then uh, as the CEO, you know, two years after that. And so it's been a really sort of organic experience, I suppose, but in many ways, like Wikipedia um, and all those those experiences sort of built up to to where I am here. Can you explain how um, I want to talk about first the the sort of just the structural conditions of Wikipedia, like how it exists as an organization? Then we can talk about it more on the sort of technical side. But 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 what is it as a as a you know as a tax entity, for instance, in the United <laughs> States? Like what what is Wikipedia? What does the organization look like? So the Wikimedia Foundation is a five hundred one c three. So that means we are a registered nonprofit, non commercial charity, like many of your favorite other sort of nonprofits. Um, we operate. Uh, headquartered here in the United States, incorporated here in the United States, but our services are provided globally. Uh, we have a staff that are spread out around the world. And then Wikipedia itself is the thing that no one really owns. It's, it's sort of an interesting, it's an interesting question about, um, that goes right to the heart of, of some of the values of the early internet. We're freely licensed. Our software is all open source and itself freely licensed. The sort of literal entity of Wikipedia that anybody has tangible assets around is just the, the brand that, you know, the trademarks that you recognize. But we run the sites, we make sure that it's accessible, we have, you know, manage all of our own servers, um, all of that in order to keep Wikipedia sort of rolling for the world. When did this transition, like, how did, I know Jimmy Wales is the founder, and, and it started as a sort of small collaborative project, and then grew and grew and grew, like, how did it sort of reach its current kind of like, legal and organizational status? Yeah, in 2001, Jimmy founded Wikipedia, and he actually founded something different first. It was something called Newpedia, and it was meant to replicate uh, an encyclopedia for the web at a time when the web was a very different place. Um, it was far more distributed. It was far less commercialized, as you know, you've know, you spoken about. And it was missing some of those general purpose resources that we now think of it, the, you know, the web as sort of being omnibus. It has everything in it. But at the time, there was no way to go look up in a really sort of structured way the population of X or the history of Y. Um, and so Jimmy created Newpedia. Now, Newpedia was meant to be peer reviewed, very much like a traditional encyclopedia, while he was in the process of trying to set that up. Um, and it was hard, slow going, trying to get folks to volunteer their time to do this. Uh, he set up a wiki. Now, a wiki is just a type of software it's created by this guy called Ward Cunningham um, that allowed you to publish to the web very quickly. It's wiki comes from the Hawaiian word wiki wiki, which means quick. Uh -huh. It's hard to remember now 20 years later, but in the old days, you kind of had to like know HTML or CSS in order to publish to the web. You had to have your own, um, you know, you had to run your own website. You maybe had to host it somewhere. And a wiki could just let you publish. If you set up a wiki, anyone could come along. They could enter into it. They could edit it. They could collaborate. Um, changes were really simple and fast. You could go back and look at the entire version history of a change to every page. And so Jimmy set up a wiki, and in that wiki, people started writing articles. And in the first year, there were tens of thousands of articles. And Jimmy went, aha, I think this, this thing, this might be the way we go. Right, because at the time, like, it was the sort of comparative advantage that he's, he'd set up a way of like, very easily publishing to the internet and sharing your knowledge on something. That's exactly right. And so the, the other piece about Wikipedia's lore, and, you know, 
it is lore because some of this is sort of lost to time, is that it was created in January of 2001. And part of the lore goes that in September of 2001, you know, the United States, uh, of course, was the site of the attacks on September 11th. And people, for the very first time, were extremely online looking for information because mm. we didn't have much information about what the heck was going on other than what was coming across broadcast news. And so the sort of story of Wikipedia goes is that people then filled Wikipedia with all sorts of relevant information that had not yet made it into that digital transformation or digital transition rather to get information that was available that anyone could access. So it was sort of like putting a library on the web with this basic general purpose information. And that, sort of, as the story goes, was really the jumping off point for Wikipedia when readership spiked and, and the growth you know, took off in a way that we never looked back. And then there's been over over time there have been this you know incredibly complex sophisticated set of essentially like institutional social norms rules regulations distinctions hierarchies put into place to produce a kind of like fairly rigorous culture without central direction like how does that work Yeah uh it works in a couple different ways um one is, I mean, so it borrows from from practices that have been around for a really long time. I, I you know, it borrows from this idea that you have to have fact checking. So Wikipedia has to have, um, you have to go back to verifiable sources, reliable sources. That's all those citations or citation needed, you might see. Um, that, you know, I like to think of that as coming from journalism. You have to know where your facts come from. Um, it borrows from the process of peer review, this idea that you have lots of different editors who are looking at any given article on Wikipedia and um, this idea from open source software that with many eyes, all bugs are shallow. So if you have 10 people looking at an article, someone's likely to you know catch the problem right. with it. And then also from what I, I really like to think of as sort of like almost scientific inquiry, which is Wikipedia continues to evolve as information changes, which helps it prevent becoming static or out of date. You know, as we learn more about the world, as our understandings of what constitutes really kind of anything um, evolves, we edit Wikipedia and our knowledge evolves along with it. So there's that component piece and these sort of different approaches, which are codified in Wikipedia's policies from these sort of different sectors, has proven to be really resilient for the production of high quality information. The other thing about Wikipedia is it's massively decentralized, which means you don't have to have expertise uh, that pertains to more than one subject area in an, any individual editor. You can have editors who focus exclusively on breaking news events or who focus exclusively on, um, you know, 18th century literature. And they're entirely, they're connected in that they're Wikipedians. They share a set, common set of values. Sorry, Wikipedians are what we call volunteer editors. Right. Um, they share a common set of values around freedom of information, accuracy, verifiability, but their interests are tremendously disparate. And that allows them to work with others in that volunteer editing community that share similar interests and allows for different sort of areas of quality construction to emerge across, you know, kind of any, anything you can imagine. I mean, what's also interesting to me too, is that like, you know, you, people have probably heard stories like this a million times, right? Like whether it's um, when they're group collaborating for a project in fourth grade and, you know, you, you, <laughs> you work out like rudimentary division of labor and you find that like some people are really into it and some aren't and some <laughs> have different talents. Some tend to be like, um, you know, more take charge, some tend to be like, you know, th this experiment in massive distributed collaboration has led to l lots of sort of hierarchy and distinctions. I mean, not not in a, you know, in a bad way. It's just that there's there are levels of seniority. Different people have different access to different ways. Other people can trump other people. And all of this has been kind of bootstrapped up to produce a sustainable means of both collaborating and quality control. Yeah, yeah, role differentiation and task friction. Um, and I think that to your point, we often talk about if you want to create a complex system, you have to start with the simplest possible sort of set of building blocks. And Wikipedians have built on this incredibly simple thing, this wiki, which gave people enough latitude to be creative while also having sort of a, a nice framework that we did that creativity within. And that is true, too, with this idea of the production of, of roles and hierarchy. So within Wikipedia, you can be a volunteer editor. Anyone can be an editor, truly 
really anyone, if you're listening to this, you're an ed- you can be an editor. Um, but as you learn the practices of Wikipedia, you can then become an administrator. And from an administrator, there's sort of a series of additional permissions that you can get all the way up to being a steward, which is there's about 35 of them in the world today. And they have almost un limited control over over the projects, as we call them, basically the same as we have as employees at, at the foundation. And the remarkable thing about all of this is that all of these permissions are granted by your peers. So you have to request access to these permissions. Your peers can review all of the work that you've done to determine if you're credible and trustworthy. And they can also revoke these permissions at any point in time if it seems like the power's gone to your head. And so it ends up being this tremendously sort of self-regulatory ecosystem in which we all kind of know each other and, and know the ways in which we work productively together, even if we've never met one another and we don't know your real name. Here's the thing that's so crazy. What you're describing is, and there's a great book by a, a digital theorist named Clay Shirky called Here Comes Everybody, which mm-hmm. I recommend to people. What you're describing was like a mode of human organization that there was a period where we thought that was the future possibility for all kinds of human organization. Mm-hmm. Like decommodified digital cooperation that used kind of these technologies to create these sort of peer checks such that no one was, it was neither the case that anyone was sort of in charge in some sort of ultimate final sense, but it was also not the case that you just had like flat chaos, right? Wikipedia is something between those two. It's not a traditional organization with a top down and a a CEO says, you, we're not publishing this or we are publishing this, but it's also not like the chaos of like a swarm <laughs> that that you often see on the internet in a million different directions, right? With disinformation like pinging around. It, it's figured out a way to be sort of in between the two. And there was a, a great hope and, and a lot of models of human collaboration in the more decommodified era of the internet. I would say the early mass internet, which is I think the 2000s. Why didn't like... <laughs> Why did Wikipedia survive and work and we didn't get more of it? Yeah. Yeah. So we're not a democracy, but we're also not an anarchy is, is one way to think about right. it. Um, yeah, that right. That's yeah. Awesome. <laughs> or something in between. Um it's it's a it's a great question. I, I think that the answer to why did it work was a few is a few things. One is that it is highly decentralized and decision-making doesn't sit in a few hands. So as you said, I'm not in charge. I like to say I'm accountable for everything, but I'm not really in charge of the community at all. I can talk to them. I have influence, but um, Jimmy and Wales, our founder, is not in charge. He has influence, but it ultimately the agency over the entity belongs in the hand of the people who create it. And there is a shared sense of responsibility and accountability that's held through that. Another critical piece here is we're a nonprofit. And I... You know, I don't want to oversimplify wh- how much this matters, but it really matters. It absolutely matters. It's to <laughs> me, to me, like that's a big part of it, right? Is that there were all these non-profit driven decommodified spaces on the internet that I loved that then got all, they basically all got commodified. It's, I know, it all went away. It's so sad. I, I'm, I am also a, a child of the early internet, but the nonprofit component piece meant that we had the freedom to continue to experiment and tweak the model. There was no, what people, Wikipedians like to say is there is no deadline. So there is no deadline for the construction of Wikipedia. There is no deadline for the completion of Wikipedia. There is right. only continuous iteration towards a better work product. And in that space- And there's no, just to be clear, there's no benchmark of like, you have to hit these none, earnings or you have to hit exactly. this, this this round of- uh, venture capital. Yeah, because those those control much of how the internet operates. That's right. And so because of that, we had very little pressure to be able to to, you know, to monetize either our users or our content, which has allowed for us to expand in ways and also make really difficult decisions over multiple year arcs that other entities may not have had the chance to do. So I I like to joke when I came in in 2014, the headlines on Wikipedia were like, this is, it's dying, it's collapsing, you know, the editor numbers and why doesn't, why isn't it launching satellites with, you know, beaming Wi-Fi back into the world, like all the other cool tech companies. And we were like, well, it's just, you know, because we're, we're stuck to our values of non-commercial, you know, independence, integrity, radical cooperation. And now, you know, seven years later, 
everyone's like, wow, Wikipedia, you're doing really well. How have you avoided all these problems? And I'm like, our values were cool and then they weren't and now they are again. Huh. And the only reason we got to stick to those was because we didn't have that commercial pressure driving us to say, how do we incentivize our readers to stay longer on our sites? How do we make our sites stickier? How do we ensure that you're getting that customized feed of content that you've been looking for? How do we get editors to focus on creating content around pop stars? Because we know that that's really where the eyeballs are at, you know? And so you didn't have any of those incentives. None of them. And then difficult choices like how not to send, and because you mentioned this tech hearing that's you know, happening in Congress, sort of as we're speaking, we didn't have to comply with political pressure in places where we were nudged to alter or are asked or demanded to alter content. So we've been able to hold very fast to those core values of our only loyalty is to you, our reader to the public interest and the public good. So we don't take anything down and we do not remove content under political pressure or duress. We have been censored in countries for multiple years because we have found that the integrity of information is a higher value to us than just market access. What's interesting too about that is that like, that's just such a more defensible position where you're not making a buck off people. Because yeah. part of what is maddening about Silicon Valley, you know, not to overgeneralize, but you get these huge tech companies being like, our values are X and our values are Y. And this is like, you get these crazy situations where it's like, here's Mark Zuckerberg is like, here's how we're going to protect the German election. It's like, what? Why? How did we get here? <laughs> that this dude, this Harvard dropout who coded a site to rate whether girls were hot or not is saying like, well, this is where we're going to make sure the German election isn't like, you know, destroyed by disinformation or, or here's a report on how we contribute to ethic cleansing in Myanmar, right? So there's always something just unbearable to me about the – because what's what's interesting about the, the sort of culture of Silicon Valley and the culture of the internet and the culture of sort of internet engineers and entrepreneurs is that they all still have that like – they all still have that kind of early internet vintage um, catechism. <laughs> You know, when they talk about like, you know, the the don't be evil of the, you know, the, the mm -hmm. Google origin story. But now it's like there are these huge behemoths who are doing what they can to make a marginal dollar and they still spout this stuff. And it's like, seriously, stuff it. Whereas if you guys make a controversial call in one direction or another, you know, we just don't take stuff down. That's just our rule. It's like, well, that, you know, they're just doing their thing. They're not saying that because they think they can get an extra, you know, few million out of ad revenue out of me. I think that's right. I, we create trust in the institution by, by again, holding to those values and being entirely accountable to the people who fund us, which are our, our donors. Um, I find that the, you're so right about the Silicon Valley, like the sort of the origins in the, in the sort of primordial ooze of libertarianism and sort of radical patriarchy of the Valley is, is certainly um, a big part of, of, you know, the, the social theory on why it is what it is. But, you know, Wikipedia was actually able to move and transition from a very similar ethos. And yet, because we did not have sort of this capital incentive, we've also been able to evolve. So when we talk about here comes everyone, or this idea that, you know, you can just build something with the folks who show up or the volunteers who show up. I mean, we did that, but we also had a lot of problems that are endemic to broader society around in the equitable division of labor on Wikipedia, you sort of 90% of contributors and uh, or so over the majority of our time um, have been men, you know, questions of underrepresentation mm -hmm. uh, groups of groups of historically excluded um, demographics. And, and so, so much of, of that has been something that we've had to really challenge ourselves on, but because we don't have to sort of like hide it <laughs> in our quarterly, you know, for our quarterly earnings report, we're able to reckon and grapple with that very publicly and holding ourselves to account around that in a public way, I think is another strength of this model in that it is an incentive for us to get better and consistently get better, but also not have to sort of deal with the PR of what happens when things are bad. So you you just mentioned a few things I wanted to dig in on. One one is gender, like the the just the Wikipedia is overwhelmingly written and edited by men. Mm -hmm. um, you are a woman, uh, and you are a you're a tech CEO in a world that just seems like <laughs> oppressively male to me. Um, in a lot of different ways. Like what, is, what are the, what, how is your experience in, you live in San Francisco, like you're, you're sort of in the thick of it. Um, mm. It just seems like a lot of extremely, it, 
the culture of Silicon Valley, the culture of big tech, the culture of tech investment all seems gendered in a very oppressive way to me, although I am but a mere sort of observer. Yeah, it is. No, no doubt about it. And I had never had my technical bona fides questioned until I stepped into this organization, you know, despite having worked in tech for a decade prior. Um, and, and that came internally and, of course, externally, but also internally. Um, the perception of not being technical uh, was something that has dogged me the majority of my time at Wikimedia, despite running one of the largest scaled tech platforms on the planet. And so, you know, when we when we start with a recognition of this, it becomes something that is, at least to me, very personal, this idea that women have to be in the room, people of color have to be in the room, women of color, black women have to be in the room when we're making these determinations about how something that is so central to our understanding of the world operates and runs. And so, you know, when we think about Wikipedia as being often the very first search result you find when you're trying to understand, you know, the news of the day, we have an extra obligation to really ensure that we're, we're thinking about, you know, who's excluded and who's included in these decisions that are content decisions editorial decisions, product decisions, uh, and the like. So yeah, I mean, Wikipedia is, is, we have some really good news. This past year, our data shows that um, women's participation on the project increased uh, by about 50%. Now, the reason we were able to get such a high number, it was because it was so abysmally low to begin with. So that's from about 11% to 15%. And that is the result of many years of concentrated efforts to incorporate reforms into the way that Wikipedia operates to create a more welcoming space for, for everybody. I'm curious, are there, are there technical things that you can do or have done that you've discovered make um, collaboration by women more, more possible, more uh, attractive to women who, who maybe are, are not uh, engaged? Yeah. So with apologies to Megan Smith, the former US CTO, who, who really has this wonderful list of, of what makes uh, participation more appealing. It, it's, it's basically um, a few things. One, women have less leisure time. We know this. This is true universally, not just in the United States. It is consistent across ethnicity um, and socioeconomic uh, status. Women have less leisure time. And so when we ask them to participate, it is incredibly important that they know how their participation is valued right off the bat. Uh, there is a preference for cooperation and collaboration that surfaces the human relationships of community, whereas Wikipedia's you know, sort of interface right now is a very individualistic pursuit. So pairing people with a mentor and enabling folks to know how they're when they make that edit, you know, seeing it right on the on the site right away and understanding how that adds to the overall mission. Those are two really important things. Knowing what the culture is going to be before you show up is another big piece of this. And so, you, you know, you'll notice I'm not talking too much about the technical product side of things, although there are certainly ways and affordances that we can design into the experience that help bring all this forward, but much more of like, what are you designing for? What are the mm. end outcomes? And so um, for us, for example, we have now have a universal code of conduct that not only tells people what we're expecting when they participate in Wikipedia's sites about how they behave and how they you know, communicate with one another, but offers clear examples of unacceptable behavior and then recourse if you experience unacceptable behavior. So you understand where your agency lies and how you can change or fix problems within the sites themselves. You know, all of this really centers around what I think of as designing for community, whereas mm. so much of social platforms today are really about designing for users. It's like, what's my individual experience? How am I, you know, what's my personalized experience? What are the incentive structures that are designed to keep me in the product? And it's not really about what the end outcome is, whereas we are really looking at like, what's the outcome we're trying to achieve? And then how do we, you know, design backwards for that so that we, we build those experiences into the software itself? Right, because the user is the, you know, unique users and how much time they're sending on the site are the metrics that determine the essentially God metric. How, yeah. The what metric? The God metric is what yeah. it's often called. Yeah. Right, the God metric. And that's <laughs> that's the metric of, that's the, that's the you know, it's, that's the oil of the 21st century mm -hmm. is attention. You know, that's what, that's what you can make money off of. How much attention can you get out of a person? I mean, I work in the attention minds myself. Um, <laughs> you know, if you're listening to this podcast or watching my television show, so, you know, or reading my tweets, like I, I no, no, no shame in the game. It's just that um, there's lots of perverse incentives for what gets people's attention. And I think that that's a, 
that's a sort of profound point. I want to talk a little more about um, community and the sort of boundaries of that. And, and also, I'm, I'm curious if anyone's ever um, tried to buy you. <laughs> so I want to ask you. I want to ask you that after we take this quick break. So it occurs to me that if I were to say, what are the five internet sites or apps I spend most of my time on? Like Wikipedia is in that top five for sure. Now, I'm not sure I'm a typical internet user. Like I really like reading random stuff, but I think a lot of people do. <laughs> um, <laughs> has any, was there any point where someone was like, I don't know, did like Facebook say like, can we buy you? Did, did is anyone ever tried to purchase Wikipedia? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I mean, why buy the cow, right? Like we give away all the content. So, um, it, it's not necessarily, it wouldn't necessarily be the wisest business investment. And part of that is because the community is so reflexively anti-commercial. So what I mean by, you know, in 2003, Wikipedia was founded in 2001. In 2003, the Wikimedia Foundation was created, which is the organization I work for. And, um, it was the trust into which Wikipedia's assets were, were sort of um, interested. And part of that is because there was a rumor that went around that uh, Wikipedia was going to be made into a commercial entity and the entire Spanish language community took their toys and went home. They said, we're taking Spanish Wikipedia and we are not, you know, it, we're forking it as is in our language and it's not going to be a part of Wikipedia anymore. Wow. That's when, how, when, was, when was this? It was in the early 2000s, between wow. 2001, 2003, two. And it took, you know, it took a little time for the Spanish speakers to come back. Um, and I think that that speaks to the fact that even if someone did want to buy Wikipedia, you probably wouldn't then get the editing community <laughs> to come on board. Because right, they would say, yeah. screw you. I'm, I'm right. Basically, yeah. basically. So no, it's it's never really come up as a as a real proposal. <laughs> but here's the, the fascinating thing, right? If you think of it as, okay, the model of Wikipedia is people volunteer their labor because they get something out of the community mm. and they sometimes put a lot of work into this to collaborate and to work towards this goal of, of increasing the amount of available information to people. Like there's a lot of commodified, like Twitter is just people tweeting for free <laughs> and Jack Dorsey <laughs> selling ads against them. Like it's all free labor. It, that, that, in fact, that's the, the, the sort of the, the devilish genius of Facebook or Twitter or social media is that you don't actually make the content. <laughs> you just get people who will make the content for you, but then you sell ads against it. And like, that's the big difference, right? Is that there are no ads like you guys, you, what, how does your funding work such that there's enough money to make this thing you know, work because it's not, I imagine it's not massively lucrative, but like, I don't know, you, you, you got to have some engineer somewhere, right. And, and, uh, some kind of organization, like how does that work? Yeah. So, uh, readers, readers are our source of funding, About 85% of our operational budget in the year comes from small dollar donors. We have about 8 million donors around the globe and the average donation is about 15 us dollars. And so when you add that up, um, that is in just a about 100 million, a little more than 100 million these days. And that enables Wikipedia to work. It high, employs hundreds of engineers. We have a lot of engineers. Um, but it also is the basis of funding that goes straight back out to the community. So we have, a, you know, we give grants in the in millions and millions of dollars a year back to community members to help uh, support the creation of Wikipedia, particularly um, in minority languages, around content that is, as I've mentioned, underrepresented and in, in Wikipedia, um, groups who focus on sort of women and non-binary folks or, um, you know, increasing ethnic and racial diversity on Wikipedia, that, that all supports that. So, so wait, you said you have hundreds of engineers? Uh, yes. So you've got like a, there's like a real... I mean, I think I think of it, I think of it as so like ethereal yeah. and like and not localized, but like there's some office. I mean, not in COVID times, but like there's an office and people go to work there and they're engineers and like you haven't all of that stuff exists as like an actual going concern. Yeah, is my point. Yeah, I mean, we we mostly are, are all remote these days because you know we have to speak so many languages and need to support such a global community. But the yeah, when I meet in the old days when I used to take like cabs and stuff, people were like I didn't I did, didn't know anyone worked for Wikipedia. Right. <laughs> A few of us, not not a ton, but you know, relatively speaking, but a few. Here's a tough question: Is Wikipedia's success or endurance, at least, an accident of when it was born, 
Or do you see, do you retain any of the kind of optimism about a more wiki-esque internet, a more um, nonprofit collaborative internet in the future? So yes and yes. Um, Wikipedia absolutely is a product of the time in which it was born. I also always feel like I need to level with folks. You know, Wikipedia came along at a time when search engines were were relatively um, newish. And mm-hmm. so the search engine that most people use, Google, uh, as far as we know, a lot of the way that its algorithm was so successful and why people flocked to it in such great numbers was because it was built on a um, ranking system that looked at interlinking, so linking yeah. inbound and outbound to sites. And Wikipedia is nothing if not a giant set of hyperlinks. Um, right. It's why you spend hours on it at times when you should be doing your homework or you know right. <laughs> finishing that project proposal. Um, and so had we not been there at, you know, come along at that time, we we, I think we, we, first of all, we were incredibly beneficial to, to Google and in, in being available as a general purpose uh, resource of knowledge, which allowed them to truly be omnibus search, not just movie listings and restaurant opening times, but right. anything. So you guys, right. So if I go, if I, if I, the other day, for instance, when I was trying to recall my memory uh, about the year of the Fort Pillow massacre, which was a massacre of union troops, uh, largely black overseen by Nathan Bedford Forrest, the uh, vile and evil uh, Confederate general of Tennessee, whose bus is currently in the uh, Tennessee Capitol. Mm. Um, when I Googled Fort Pillow massacre to remember the year, uh, it took me to the Wikipedia page. Right. So your point there is that like, right, that that allowed, it wasn't just like, what time is this movie? But if you ask for that piece of knowledge from early on, Google and Wikipedia had a kind of symbiotic relationship because Google would be the one to service that as the first link. And then you're happy with Google because they gave you what you needed, even though Google's not actually making the content. Correct. And so, and by being this like, density of hyperlinks, we end up on the front page of almost every search around general purpose knowledge. And that enables Wikipedia to grow because it drives all this traffic to our sites on this growing search platform. And so there is an element of there at the right time that is true for Wikipedia. Now, the other piece of it, Chris, is our cost of production is so low that the barrier of entry is impossibly high. We're a volunteer project. If you want to replicate Wikipedia, it's hard to do that. It is hard to sort of compete with Wikipedia in a direct competitive way, which means that that is actually really good for us um, it also means that I actually think it's good for the public too, because it means that you don't end up with commercial capture of what is fundamentally all of our human heritage, which is knowledge, right? And that's something that belongs to each and every one of us. And in I believe deep into the core of my of my being must and should always be free. So in some ways, you know, I do think that it's actually quite beneficial to the world, but it also happens to be quite beneficial to Wikipedia. So, but that, that kind of answers the question, kind of doesn't, because what I'm hearing from you is like, we, we're kind of a unicorn. <laughs> like, <laughs> I hate that, that term, no. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, not in the Silicon Valley way. <laughs> I mean, the closest, honestly, the closest anyone on the internet is to that, to me, the sort of feel of, of that kind of decommodified is, is Reddit, which mm. I think very self consciously um, is the case. And, and Reddit has its own issues for sure. Mm. But, I think they have engineered for community in a way that other sites haven't. And they have replicated to me the closest experience of like being on a, you know, just a message board or Usenet yeah. news group back in the day. And I think that's part of what their success is. And also it should be noted, like their advertising is pretty light touch, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like I don't think those two things are accidents. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I mean, and again, that gets into sort of what's your what's your incentive, and if your incentive is profit maximization uh, for a public company, yeah, you're going to end up following that path to where it leads you. Um, and as we know, it's led to some pretty ugly places for our democracy and for our society. I want to say yes, I'm optimistic about the space for creativity on the web because I do think that the web is a fairly linear way of looking at what exists today. There's always going to be commodification of creative spaces and innovation that has been true since time immemorial. What I see as exciting and interesting is the ways in which people create culture within even commodified spaces. And so when we look at things like TikTok, for example, or when we look at things like Twitter, we still have this space in which really powerful work is being done to change culture to create, to to enable joy, um, to connect as human beings. The question is, you know, in, until when? And, and I, it tends that's, to be, yeah. 
Yeah, that's no, I did not to cut you off. I just the TikTok thing is I, I have, you know, I don't spend a lot of time on TikTok, but to the extent that I do, I'm always like delighted. Um, and it feels a lot like early internet to yeah. me, but I'm just like waiting for it to get eaten because you know what I mean? Cause it's like, right. when is this going to curdle? When is this going to get bad? Like everything gets bad because right now it's like a lot of it is just joyful, delightful, uh, clever. You know, there's a lot of the early internet, a lot of, you know, it'd be like, oh, you know, Reddit can be like this too. Like I built this incredible Lego city. Here's a picture. Like, wow, that's, <laughs> that's cool, dude. Like there's just a lot of that. And then it all, you know, it, it, it quickly collapses. And I can't tell if the reason for collapse and part of the reason I'm interested in Wikipedia is I, mean, I can never tell if the reason for collapse is something deep about human beings or something about the sort of structures and incentives of the market. And I think it's some combination between the two. Yeah, I think it's some combination of the two. I mean, the structures and incentives of the market, uh, you you know, TikTok has not yet been fully monetized, right? It's not, it's not a public right, company at this point. point. Yeah, exactly. point. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> but there's also this component piece of like, in over time, almost all of these platforms um, cr- have sub demographic groups that it sort of established power and centrality that characterizes those platforms. And so this was true of LiveJournal. This is now, you know, true of Twitter. The best ones are able to create that sense of community in a way that it feels like you're wandering from room to room and you can meet different guests in every room that you're in and everything has sort of its own culture. And that can create that space of creativity and enablement. It it tends to be when platforms have to optimize for a certain um, end yeah. set of revenue or a certain demographic that tends to you know be the most remunerative that you end up with a homogenization of the entire experience and that is I think what you're responding to. This whole idea of scale uh, within within technology is how do you get to the largest possible size with the greatest number right. of users with a minimum right. diversification right. of effort, right? And so it's why all of our you know inboxes look the same. It's why we all have the same sort of experience when we sign on to products. The best ones, in my experience, of creating that sense of that early internet that are creative are ones that have affordances for small yeah. community to particularity. Emerge. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and that's I mean that's true in TV. I mean it's true in in it's basically true in every medium, right? There's this trade off between reach and scale and and particularity, specificity. You know, the more specific and weird you are, uh, the more some small subset of people are going to love you, but the more alienating you're going to be to a larger set of people, and so you get you know you get network sitcoms are very different than what, you know, launched on streaming. Um, and that's because they had different incentives for how many people, how many eyeballs they needed and what they were doing market wise. But that trade off is always going to be there. But I agree that like it, like keeping the weirdness is really kind of part of the challenge. And then also keeping out the, the, the bad vibes and the toxicity and the kind of like swarming and bullying and all this stuff that, that, that tends to overtake a lot of these platforms. Right, which is what creates exclusion um, and, and enables sort of platform capture. And and I think that, you know, one of, sort of coming back to Wikipedia for a minute, one of the things that I find so fascinating about the way that we have to work in public is that we became very aware of that nature of sort of exclusion, whether that is gender-based or, or, you know, racial in nature or any other sort of lens that you want to look at, um, as we continue to evolve over time. So this totally radical thing, this idea that like anybody's going to be able to write the internet, anybody's going to be able to write knowledge, turned out to sort of recapitulate quite a lot of power uh, and privilege in society and whose knowledge mattered and the Western canon and everything else. But because we were doing this out in public, it was also possible for people to quantify those biases and then hold them right back up to us. So we went, oh, okay. And this is really important that we dig into this and that that we start to work to actively address this. And this is where, you know, my big thing right now is about how can we learn from this process of sort of continuous evolution of our institutions in real time so that we can create the trust that we need in order to move those institutions forward. And so Wikipedia, within our own community, we had to have that trust in order to start embarking on these questions of reform around what does harassment look like? What does it mean to be, um, you know, inclusive? How do we really think about building with intentionality for underserved communities? Um, And how have we delivered excluded them over time. How has that gone? I mean, I feel like people don't often don't love those conversations. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, it's excellent. You're doing that because I think the, the, the central paradox you're citing here, right. Which is that like here, we've got this open sort of small democratic, here comes everybody kind of platform, but it's not everybody. <laughs> and, and it's very much not everybody. It's very much a self-selecting group of people. And that self-selecting group, uh, reflects a whole bunch of 
embedded social hierarchies, which then through the process of, you know, creating the wiki probably reify certain forms of knowledge above others and certain kinds of centrality for certain kinds of exclusion and marginalization. And so we want to, we want to try to be intentional about recalibrating that, but I'm wondering how that goes over in the community. Um, well, it, because it is a large community, you know, you've always had the reformists and you've always had the sort of revanchists in those in those communities. And, and actually that sort of productive friction can be very useful for something that, like Wikipedia. Um, the, the answer on this is that first we had to quantify it, then we had to popularize it so people were aware of the discrepancies and that people understood that, you know, these discrepancies were real in society uh, or in our community, as the case may be, um, and understand the harm that that then created and why that was a limitation on perhaps the vision of Wikipedia or the ability for us to sort of achieve the potential that we wanted to be able to achieve. And then we had to have a conversation about the specific ways in which we would go about addressing and redressing um, these exclusions, while also not threatening the ways in which people currently work today that makes them successful. So I don't know if you're catching catching any parallels to some of the conversations we're having yeah. in the, in the well, broader... I can, hear you, I can hear you verbally walking along a tightrope. I mean, it, it seems like... Um, yeah, because I think, yeah, I mean, and, and people get very territorial about these spaces, obviously. And if you come in and you say, look, it's a problem that 90% of the people you know, who are working on this topic are men and you're going to get a lot of men being like, well, we do, do no one, we're just volunteers. Exactly. Yeah. No one, no one said men only and we want to come, they can come. You know, I mean, I've, I've been in a million conversations <laughs> like that. Um, and they tend to be, you know, people get defensive. So the way that we went about this was we created a process for conversation and dialogue with our communities that was all about looking 10 years out and saying, who do we want to be when we grow up, essentially? And by looking 10 years out, part of the way that we were able to do this in that was less threatening was most people don't really have a good vision for themselves 10 years out. They don't necessarily have a strong sense of whether they're still going to be in the role that they're playing today. It allows them to free up their um, tightly held sort of beliefs or interests from sort of that eventual visioning process. And by engaging people and inviting them into having that conversation, it, it loosened up sort of that, that locus of control that, that individuals had um, and created space for us to formalize reformists. So we are, always had people who wanted this to be a more inclusive sort of vision. Um, they were given the space and the platform to be able to express what that would mean. And because they came from internal to the internal I to see. the entity, right, right. they were already trusted and understood how best to respond um, to the in inevitable objections. And, and through that process, we were able to forge a new consensus for how we might move forward that accommodates for some of this reformist vision while also being really true to some from whence we came. What are you going to do next? I don't know. <laughs> I um, have been at Wikimedia for seven years, and it is... I think a really critical sort of a critical piece, a hallmark of every robust movement that there is turnover and regeneration. And it felt like we'd done all this work of setting a vision and it was time for new leadership to step up. And in order to do that, you know, someone has to step down. So um, I'm going to take a break and then I'm, I'm going to have to figure that out, but it's not like the world is short on challenges. So no, there's a lot going on. There's yeah. definitely a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. Catherine Marr is the CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation, the nonprofit organization that runs Wikipedia and the Wikimedia Projects. Uh, it was great to talk to you, Catherine. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for the time, Chris. Once again, my great thanks to Catherine Marr. Um, you can find Wikipedia on the internet. You probably don't need me to link you to it. Um, but we'd love to hear your feedback. Tweet us with the hashtag withpod, email at withpod at gmail.com. Why is this happening? It's presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In team and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here by going to nbcnews.com slash why is this happening. <laughs>